Okay, so welcome once again, and today's How to Advocacy chat will be devoted to the innovation in scholarly communication in the humanities and social sciences. So our uh, idea of those open chats is to meet with various people and discuss what kind of advocacy uh, we need to empower uh, humanities and social sciences. Uh, okay, so whenever you want to, you may uh, jump in with your question uh, or just uh, let us know about it on, on the chat. Uh, and just to introduce myself, my name is Magdalena Vnuk and I'm a, I am a member of the Operas Advocacy Special Interest Group and a coordinator of the uh, Operas Polish National Node operating in Warsaw. My background is in cultural anthropology and history, but right now I am involved in uh, various projects regarding open scholarly communication. And together with our today's guest, uh, Maciej Marel, who is the director of the Digital Humanities Center at the Institute of Literary Research at the Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, we work on uh, operas projects. Uh, okay, so maybe before we go on with the topic, uh, Maciej, could you briefly introduce yourself? Uh, let us know who you are. Oh, yeah, hi, hi everyone, and thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so basically, I'm uh, as mentioned, I'm, I'm involved in the uh, Digital Humanities Center in, in in Warsaw. My background is in literature and social sciences, um, and I'm also have been involved in operas for quite a long time. I'm a member of Executive uh, Assembly. And uh, uh, together with uh, my colleague Marta uh, Boaszczyńska, we are uh, co-running the Operas Innovation Lab, about which we probably will say a few words uh, today. Uh, thank you, Maciej. And once again, uh, our open chat, as well as this, the whole special interest group uh, for advocacy, are devoted to advocacy, meaning that our goal is to support the social sciences in and, and humanities in effectively communicating their outputs and achievements. So let's start from the very, very uh, general question. Uh, open communication in academia means innovation. Maciej, would you stand by this statement? Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that the innovation supports communication, but probably in, in responding to that, I will just uh, refer to the uh, to the study we did uh, two years ago, actually, um, in, within the Operas P project. Uh, we did a series of interviews with scholars, uh, SSH scholars in uh, in Europe, uh, mostly in Europe, with some uh, also from uh, from Americas. Um, however, the um, and, and we asked about a bunch of questions about their practices, their writing practices, etc. But we also asked about innovation, and um, what they said was pretty interesting, uh, meaning that uh, they understood innovation in scholarly communication in two waves. So first, there was an innovation of uh, access, so basically uh, using new technologies to make your work uh, visible. Uh, so you know, publishing in an open repositories. Uh, um, making it uh, you know discoverable through various engines uh, uh, and basically keeping keeping it open and, uh, and findable so that was like one side and the other was something we call the innovation of form so basically using new um probably uh, also kind of innovative uh, formats to uh, uh to 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 convey your argument better to you know kind of expand your uh, um, the capacities you know you just have in a, a printed book or like PDF paper so just use something else so for instance it's about uh, linking uh, text and data so you want to uh, you have uh, a paper which bases on some data and you want for instance to include uh, uh, the data in the paper or at least link it with the repository or show interactive visualization uh, so this kind of uh, stuff but not only it was also about for instance digital editions and a uh, bunch of stuff so basically there are like two those two kind of understanding of uh, innovation about among um, scholars i would say so if you were to say uh, what does innovation mean for the humanities for the yeah for the modern humanities mm -hmm. let's say so I, I would say that it, it, it should kind of support uh the humanities and uh in, in the sense that you know um 
uh, I mean, of course, the, the, the history of Comentis research is, is, is long, but it's always somehow linked. I mean, what we do is linked to the technology we have at, uh, at hand and how we kind of proceed. And of course, we can go back to, you know, the, to, to the invention of printing, how it changed, you know, while we're thinking about the world and uh, how uh, we start like thinking more objectively, for instance, about uh, the reality, etc. With digital uh, transformation, it's, uh, it's another let's say step and we can say forward uh, so we can um we can just you know again expand the uh, the boundaries of a printed book and uh, and try to 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 to, to do something more uh, for instance i will just give you an example probably it's better to explain things uh, through uh, examples so um uh, in, 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 in my institution in Poland, we have uh, um, the Department of Literary Bibliography and we have uh, something that's called the resource called Polish Literary Bibliography, which is a kind of database, expanded database of uh, and works, uh, um, their uh, reception, like, you know, reviews, adaptations, etc. So everything kind of linked in the database. Uh, we kind of recently uh, expanded it, made, made it better searchable, change the data model, etc. So uh, this sort of output of work is a, is a kind of database. So it's a kind of new new uh, idea of whatever, of uh, scholarly output being something not as a publication, but rather uh, a tool that could be used by, by other scholars. So before that, we thought about, you know, bibliographies as, you know, simple reference guides. So, you know, I wanted to, to check, uh, you know, whatever, what was written about this author. And I look it up. Nowadays, we kind of use it as a kind of linked data. So also to track some processes, to track, you know, uh, to, to, to plot, for instance, relationship between uh, um, authors, etc. Uh, or to, to, to basically, I don't know, compare reception throughout countries. So these data sources are, 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 are provide our interesting insights. Um, however, uh, so this is a kind of in, innovative output, innovative approach. Something we we, we can uh, uh, we can um, publish and give uh, uh, scholars to you know to use. Um, yet sometimes innovation, like in this example, is kind of constrained by formal boundaries, formal assessment, uh, uh, formal um, evaluation. So so in our case, for instance, each time we have the assessment of scientific units in Poland, we have to create a database dump in a form of PDF monograph. I mean, it has to be a monograph. So it's like a monograph consisting of bibliographic records with a scientific, of course, review, etc. cetera. Uh, but, you know, so, so somehow to conform to older formats, although we kind of don't need them anymore. We don't need those uh, printed reference books because databases do it do it better. So kind of uh, returning to the uh, initial questions, what, what innovation means for the humanities. So I think that uh, um, technology and innovation kind of unlocks the potential of like doing things a bit differently in a way that it's kind of more attuning them more to our actual practices. So uh, we don't need to think about our work as something that has to finish in an article or in a uh, monograph or something, but rather something, you know, else more fitting to uh, uh, to the topic or to, 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 to our intentions. And I think today, later on, we probably will have time to, 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 to look into some more uh, cases uh, to, 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 to illustrate this uh, thesis. Yeah, but it was also the perfect example for advocacy since, as you mentioned, we have innovation, but still the administrative level or the, I don't know, let's say the academic scholarly system just does not catch up with this innovation. Mm -hmm. So if you, for instance, if you were to suggest how to change this, how to change the minds of, uh, you know, of the ministerial uh, officials, not to make you uh, print this database, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, let's start with this. It's not only about ministries. So it's probably, I mean, and I think we're touching upon like this very issue of advocacy, which has to be directed into multiple different stakeholders. Like, for instance, in our uh, research, we have this uh, PhD student uh, reporting that he was preparing uh, a scholarly edition. And he uh, realized that uh, uh, the best form for this uh, edition would be the digital one because I don't, I, I don't remember perhaps there were like so many variants and like other data to be linked with this one. However, his uh, uh, supervisor said that, okay, okay, it's nice, fun, but okay, but, but, but we need uh, also something uh, tangible. We need uh, we need uh, a printed or closed version. And so in this sense, uh, I know that in some, probably in some uh, faculties already, the digital format could go as a proper scholarly work, but now 
not everywhere. So it's still, we're still facing something which is called a kind of double publication so that you just prepare one input, sorry, one output because it's uh, uh, suitable for your work, like the database I mentioned, like the digital scholar edition, like uh, uh, interactive article. And then you have the as a proper output, which is uh, uh, basically following the, the, the traditional rules, it's published in a journal. It's published by a uh, by um, a publishing house in the monograph. So it gets this kind of recognition for your institution, for your ministry, for your supervisor, and uh, um, so 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 this is like a innovation kind of goes around the those many stakeholders. There's the issue, of course, of, of prestige and 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 of uh, of of what we consider to be a proper work and proper output in our um, disciplines. So in order to advocate for this, we, we need to, uh, to, 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 to work with, uh, uh, with different uh, stakeholders. And um, I can I, yeah, just to, 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 again, to stick to some actual uh, work uh, we're doing, we can, we can give an example of uh, uh, work we do in the project Nopras PL in Poland, uh, uh, which is okay, that now it's also funny because I'll be talking about the project which is led by Magda, who's interviewing me, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I, I'll just uh, uh, <laughs> try to be uh, more exact and, and, and to give um, the proper information. Basically what we do uh, in, in our project, uh, uh, we do many things, but uh, on the innovation side, we uh, first of all we want to talk with uh with um with the publishers you know about their needs again but also about what they consider uh what they need to for instance to switch or to move towards more innovative uh formats uh, or uh, at least to, uh, to 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 that includes of course opening up their resources but also just trying to move uh towards new um, possibilities. Uh, we will prepare uh, an experimental monograph, which would be like an extended monograph, which will be kind of pro kind of prototype of cooperation between uh, researchers, publishers, and IT uh, producers, just to trace some problems we may have uh, on the way, like for instance, how to prototype the evaluation of this output. We want to do it as well with uh, other scholars to invite them to to, uh, to, to provide this evaluation, which should comprise of both uh, the content of the monograph, but also its technical side, basically. Uh, so there's another thing. And also we want to do like the uh, design thinking workshops to kind of prototype uh, the ideas uh, for the recommendations of an evaluation for uh, the ministry, basically. So we want to also um, uh, work with this stakeholder. So uh, basically uh, we, oh, we lost Magda though. Uh, she said she had some problems recently with the internet. Okay, I'll be talking <laughs> until she uh, she gets back. She should be back soon. Anyway, so what we what we want to do is to uh, to to kind of uh, to kind of uh, get some recommendations for for the ministry. So just kind of summing up on this um, on this. Um, uh, plan for Opera's PL or to concrete action is to basically do this kind of systemic work with different uh, uh, stakeholders, which is not easy because it's like really difficult to say where to start. So, for instance, if we have researchers, uh, this is also like something we we realize when interviewing uh, people. So, um, for instance, early career researchers are more uh, kind of interested in, in in testing, experimenting with new formats. However, they are kind of blocked by the fact that they need to, uh, the, the output needs to be recognized. There, there's a prestige uh, economy, et cetera, that they, they need to publish something that is recognizable because they want to get hired after uh, they uh, get this PhD or, 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 uh, or their ten tenure track or whatever it is. Uh, on the other side, there are uh, more advanced researchers who are kind of reluctant uh, to, because they already know, kind of kind of established with the, with the way they do that they kind of happy with the way uh the things go and of course it's it's not uh, and not um, true for all researchers but we, we saw this general uh, tendency that it's really hard to 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 say where to start with uh with that and so we have to start with in many places and try to 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 advocate um slowly and um and uh, to to get some uh, some results um and i think that yeah because uh, it's uh, so what we can do is we can wait for mother i can continue or we can also start with quite with with uh 
a quick question for asking for quick questions from uh, from you about I don't know difficulties you may have or in advocacy. Oh, Marta wanted. Hello, everyone. Um, just since we're waiting for Magda, or I see she's coming back, I just wanted to add something to what mm -hmm. Mati was saying because we did indeed see the this this discrepancy between um early career researchers and their more established colleagues but sometimes the advice was also coming from a position of care so supervisors were um, excited about the innovative ideas that uh, their younger colleagues had or the people who are writing phds with them but they were just telling them this is not the right moment just wait a little bit that was also quite clear so um so it was going, I guess, both ways. So the system is theirs, um, which is, of course, run by people and by uh, people's decisions. But at the same time, on the individual level, this often means that even people who are supporting innovation are actually, in practice, advising against it uh, for the people, uh, for their colleagues who are not quite established yet. So that's all I just wanted to add. Perfect. Thanks. So, so Mark, we just finished the the question and and uh, put a quick run so we can go with the next one. Perfect. Sorry <laughs> for that. I completely lost the connection. Okay. So uh, I wanted to ask about the Operas Innovation Lab as well. I'm not sure whether you were mentioning it already or not. A bit. No, but not so much. Yeah. So we didn't. Okay. We didn't so what do you think will be the plan for Operas Innovation Lab to? you know, to implement some more advocacy into our, the actions of operas. Uh, yeah, so basically what we want to do, uh, yeah, I mean, Operas is in the, also in a unique position to uh, to kind of work uh, on different levels with different stakeholders, also, you know, in the, on the European level, but also nationally um with with our national whatever ministries stakeholders etc but also internationally with the scholarly community associations etc and this is like i think already was something what's uh, what's going on in our uh, community uh, as for the uh, opera innovation lab what we're planning to do uh, right now we're we're trying to uh um to to uh to set up like the more let's say permanent presence to to, to create like a space on the opera's website where we'll be uh providing some information about like whatever ongoing um projects or innovative approaches so people also have like a one uh one um place when they can check you know what's going on what, what what's new so that's uh that's uh, uh, more about like raising awareness of what the innovation is or could be. Uh, the second uh, second um, important uh, thing we'll be doing uh, next year is to work with uh, with case studies. So we just we selected the particular examples of innovation uh, um, to uh, which are basically to, uh, uh, to meant to um, uh, to 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 to. to um, uh, throughout this process, we are trying to to get to know what are the obstacles for innovation and what could be the remedies. So we'll be kind of not only uh, asking questions this time, but also trying to uh, collaboratively to find answers for that and document this process and um, and uh, kind of publish the guidelines for for uh, for scholars. So that would be uh, on one hand the guidelines for scholars, on the other the guidelines how to evaluate those uh, formats. So that could be uh, so that could be used by. Uh, by institutions, by other, by other researchers. Um, it, this work is also what's important to mention. Uh, is kind of feeds into the current or ongoing uh, research assessment reform. So I don't know uh, uh, if you are uh, familiar with that, but if uh, it's basically uh, uh, the kind of working group in the European Commission with uh, lots of stakeholders uh, produced this kind of agre agreement that we're kind of moving towards uh, a new research assessment model, which would, on one hand, uh, be more oriented on qualitative measures where possible, but on the other would also recognize lots of activities which are currently under the radar of research assessment. So we do lots of things as scholars uh, in various roles. We do lots of things that uh, are not credited as scholarly uh, work. So, uh, so this research assessment reform goes to in, in that direction. And uh, uh, what we want to do as uh, uh, as Opera's Innovation Lab is to provide some uh, uh, some concrete guidelines, examples from 
um, uh, social sciences and humanities, so that uh, um, this process could be kind of supported. Uh, so that's our that's our goal for now. Well, if if I may also add, since uh, as a as a coordinator of the Operas PL, we are also planning on reaching out to publishers, as Maciej mentioned before. So since Operas is an infrastructure also targeted at publishers. Uh, we, as a yeah, as our national uh, note, also would like to prepare some guidelines, at least for Polish publishers, on how to implement a more innovative approach. And it is also part of advocacy, uh, as I understand. And hopefully, uh, this this advocacy, starting from uh, publishers, will finally reach uh, the the higher level, yeah, of the decision makers. So this is our uh, aim for the for the next uh, two years. Uh, and yes, since we are talking about the future, uh, I also wanted to ask you know some kind of a vision for the future. Uh, so uh, where will those uh, changes that we are talking about? So that these uh, digital tools and communication and this uh, evaluation of the impact, where will they lead the academic uh, community, at least in terms of the humanities and uh, social sciences? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good question, a difficult one, because, you know, just to imagine what uh, what is possible and uh, every year kind of we learn about new uh, new things and new opportunities. Uh, but in general, if we look at the process, what I see that would be the uh, um, the, 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 the the main, let's say, uh, changes that we probably we as scholars, we uh, all the time we would need uh, more and more competences in a way to 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 navigate uh, those formats and those uh, 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 those uh, new let's say uh, methods on 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 working with our outputs uh, or and inputs for instance with data and how we kind of later um, publish it. So this is like I think that uh, that it, and it's not like uh, another burden, but rather something that we have to learn to uh, improve our workflows, to make them uh, I don't know, easier, more efficient, but also more shareable. So, you know, if we work with, for instance, with, uh, um, with scans, so we, we may we may learn how to better kind of handle them, how to how to publish them, process them, and publish them for uh, for uh, for others. You know, so this is like something I I see. So basically, I see that uh, definitely uh, we need we, there will be a change in how uh, how what competences we need in which in which kind of roles we are uh, uh, we as scholars are um, uh, are kind of uh, working. So it's not only like just writing. A paper, but you know, lots of different roles within the research projects, like you know, providing data, uh, annotating, uh, analyzing, uh, etc. So all those different roles would need some uh, some uh, new uh, competences, but also see it as a kind of um, move towards a more collaborative uh, work, uh, also on the output. So basically, that uh, um, we already work in research teams in digital humanities uh, with people with the matching competences but uh, but sometimes uh, uh, it's just you know like a kind of team process in which somebody knows how to do one thing somebody knows how to do another and we kind of it's kind of complementary to each other so again i see it's like a kind of contrary of what we think about humanities has been like really individual uh, work of of singular uh, single scholars i see it as a kind of move towards uh, like really a collaborative uh, enterprise. So this is like something, uh, uh, something I, I, I definitely see here. Yeah. And maybe like the last point I, I can get is also this is a kind of chance for, uh, for better impact, I guess here. So it's like also like we, when we engage with innovation, with uh, with new platforms, with uh, with new ways of of conveying uh, um, our uh, work, it's uh, better visible, uh, it's better findable, but also it could be uh, um, also some kind of transmitted in the in the way uh, that people kind of currently. Um, enjoy the uh, their uh, um, their let's say cont or the, let's say like this is this kind of term media consumption or whatever so something in a way that you know that we 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 can uh, provide like more interactive for instance and uh, more uh, multimedia uh, content where where it is uh, uh, possible or important so that people can actually uh, um, enjoy the, the 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 results of the scholarly work through. 
certain platforms or 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 or, or, or uh, no, this kind of uh, mm, uh, innovative let's say combinations of uh, media i don't maybe i'll just show you an example of that so <laughs> so we can uh we can uh, uh is because it's like when i'm listening to myself it's like really becoming really theoretical um so uh when thinking what to show you i prepare one example uh but it, it kind of touches upon those issues we uh, just discussed uh, about collaboration and uh um collaboration evaluation uh and uh, uh and uh, kind of this kind of public outreach so um this is the resource is, is the new parent panorama of polish literature our resource in the, at the institute but i wanted to show you one of their uh, they and they producing those uh, different extended monographs and this one is these ones are in polish but uh, uh this one hopefully will become uh, also an English resource uh, in in a couple of years through a project we're currently running. So, but this is the uh, the uh, Atlas of Holocaust literature. But I wanted to show you show it to you as an example of example of this uh, interdisciplinary work, but also the work which kind of needs to be published this way because otherwise it's uh, it's not uh, as handy as a resource as as uh, as it could be so this is basically the the atlas of holocaust literature uh is based on the documents uh, from uh, from uh, in, for now it's from the polish from the warsaw ghetto some documents which were um annotated for uh, for people for entities for people and for places where the, those people are um, uh, located in or you know throughout their um, their lives uh, so here we have those three elements places people and events if we start with places uh, we can uh, um, we can choose the address we're interested in these are the streets in Warsaw basically and again story that it's just uh, uh, that is just a, uh, a resource currently is not available in uh, um, uh, it's, it's just available in Polish. However, you see that we can later we we get some maps. We can browse uh, the maps uh, with uh, with certain descriptions of the events that took place with uh, with uh, with the route because, for instance, somebody traverse this route and we can just see you know the uh, uh the uh, description of that etc uh, so basically uh we, we can go through this we can go through events through what happens but uh what you can see here uh, in this resource is a kind of combination of basically the work of researchers the work of uh, um also soft software engineers who 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 uh um, who, who who work with our um edition but also of, uh, of the cartographers of um in historians and of cultural heritage institutions that provided some uh some pictures uh for instance of those uh, places uh, uh which are kind of browsable in the uh, um in the in interface so uh, basically uh, this kind of idea that you know uh, we have this kind of resource which is interlinked with different uh, places with different people you can browse it you can do your own research on it you can learn on it you can check uh, also as a citizen what happened on the streets you're living in you know this all, all those uh, things so uh, this this is how i kind of see the uh, uh the innovative um uh, output um in the future so, so the kind of output that would not be possible to be put into the uh, uh like you know single pdf monograph or something it kind of extends the uh, uh the limits of this format okay perfect just getting back to what you said in the very beginning to the distinction uh, of innovation of innovative work so we have open access and these collections all are completely open uh, mm -hmm. to, to any user that will uh, get into the site as well as they are innovative in form uh, mm -hmm. and it's it's not always you know like that that easily understood by uh, both researchers and also uh, simple readers but this is this kind of work that we would like to also advocate for. It, it, it kind of broadens our idea on what we can do as, uh, as humanistic researchers. And also there are uh, social scientists involved as well. So this is a very interdisciplinary project. Uh, okay, so you showed us some examples. And before I will get, I will 
reach to the our to our audience today and ask them about their examples or any questions they have regarding their innovative uh, projects could you first give us some advice on how to proceed if one wants to make their scholarly work more accessible uh, for wider audiences or wants to make it more innovative mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and again, it's excellent and difficult questions, and this is like basic, <laughs> exactly what we plan to do with uh, in the Opera's Innovation Lab in our resources page to provide some um, some uh, guidelines. But basically, I mean, uh, as a rule of thumb, basically, I would say that uh, um, whenever we're like in doubt or we just need some support in that we have to look at uh, what uh, the infrastructures are uh, providing research infrastructures European research infrastructures which because basically their uh, their goal is to uh, support us as researchers or, or people who want to to publish those outputs um so we can take a look uh, and of course there's operas we uh we, we uh we're working with but there's also uh daria for digital humanities and ours there's a uh, clarin uh, the different is infrastructures who, who whose role is to uh um to provide us with uh with uh, supports with the actual work we're uh doing so this is like something because sometimes it was interesting that many uh, very often people don't um our researchers don't uh, don't know or kind of are hesitant to get in touch with uh, uh, with um, infrastructures or, or don't know the, basically the, what they can um, offer. Uh, and another thing which is important is that uh, those infrastructures provide resources, or resources that could be used uh, like teaching resources or or step-by-step -step guides to whatever problem uh, or, or or issue you may um, you may have. Um, one particular example example I can uh, I can share right now doesn't come exactly from infrastructure but from um from uh, uh, Alia the uh, all academies uh, association uh, the one uh, there's a e humanities working groups uh, I'm involved in and uh, we uh, kind of produced I'm sharing it right now in the chat this uh, this kind of report on on data fair and data fair data sharing in the humanities but this is like this kind of guideline that allows you to and that, I mean to grasp the basic concepts, uh, but also uh, opens the gateway to different resources because there are like really many resources out there. I mean about like how to publish your stuff, how to work with your data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but uh, sometimes they are like too scattered, and sometimes the entry, uh, uh, the entry level is too 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 too, too high, basically, uh, like for for people who are really new to that. So with this idea in mind, we've created this. Uh, those guidelines to for for researchers and uh, um, in the next year as as mentioned we will be uh, offering some guidelines for um for, uh, for for specific guidelines for those outputs we for Lucas case studies will be working with, uh, working with and this this would be uh, the case studies we we are uh, we have in mind would be uh, for instance a toolkit so like you know if you produce a resource which is a kind of toolkit, a kind of uh, um, resource for researchers uh, that they, they can kind of learn something from it. Um, we actually we are we are uh, uh, basing it uh, in, in cooperation with uh, with a Shape ID project. There's an excellent toolkit for interdisciplinary researchers. So, uh, for instance, if you want to publish a toolkit. There are like so many problems on the way. You you cannot imagine as a researcher starting because I I know for sure because uh, uh, I was uh, in the research group team that kind of developed this toolkit and uh, uh, it was really hard in the beginning just to you know to 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 map all the steps we need to to produce this resource to publish it how to sustain it afterwards etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So this kind of work uh, should be uh, used to 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 kind of produce certain guidelines are kind of reflective guidelines so like what what are the steps and what what you have to think about and what kind of decisions you have to make so that your uh you can uh you can produce such an output and uh as a companion to this what would be uh the way to kind of evaluate it because you know this is a problem that we publish a toolkit but uh, actually it's again it's not it doesn't count as a you know proper scholarly work so how to make it um count like that um so in some yeah there's like uh, there's lots of information out there and there are lots of problems out there so you, so you can try to attune your uh, you know the search for, for 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 guidelines to those problems but perhaps you know we can also try to 
scope some problems today and and see if we can have some uh um ideas or or, or responses thank you that 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 was interesting definitely with the toolkits uh for me the shape id toolkit it was uh really really very um very detailed like i would say uh really like a nice job so anyways uh, since you are here with us uh, i think that innovation and open access uh, is something essential to your work as well so we would very much appreciate if you shared some uh, ideas or some, some examples with us of your work of or of your problems that you face uh, when you try to you know to do the innovative work and i don't know you don't uh, have enough support from your institution or uh, even in your country from the scholarly system so any any examples uh, that you could share uh, would be very much appreciated here and just to clarify it's not for me it's for the audience <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mention it. Mm. I see. Yeah. Any questions or 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 yeah or or maybe you you you're engaging with innovation yeah and uh, you can you can share some examples with that of, with us. I think that means no. <laughs> yeah, we will not keep you longer if you if you have uh, if you don't want to share. But maybe you have some other questions regarding the Opera's infrastructure, any services that we have uh, and that we are developing right now. Yes, uh, Bianca, please. Oh, oh hello. Hi. Um, so I wasn't saying anything because I am afraid I'm going to go a little bit off topic here, but I would like love to pick your brains on, on this, actually. So I'm um, going to present myself briefly so you'll understand where I'm coming from. So I'm working in data management in the humanities. So I'm a data steward, a brand new team created in the university. So what we, we deal at the moment mostly, it's um, research projects that have won a Horizon Europe grant, for example, and need a data management plan and often researchers need um, help with, uh, with with their data management sometimes even understanding what what it's all about so i uh, in particular work with humanities scholars and uh, i have to say that at the moment i haven't unfortunately come across an innovative project in the way you just described but my question is if um in a, in a situation in which a, um, we have a researcher who has a very innovative digital humanities project with data and then with, with visualizations and all of that. Um, how would we look at long-term preservation of these of these materials? Because uh, from the fair data management point of view, obviously depositing in a repository is you know number one. So you get a DOI, you you know. But uh, so how, if you could comment maybe on the intersection of of this with uh, with the work you're doing? Thank you very much. Thank you, and this is like a really uh, excellent point. And um, and, the, and you know, of course, you, you nailed the, the, the biggest one of the biggest problems. Of course, we have when talking about the uh, digital uh, projects or data um, in general. Um, so uh, I would say that first of all, um, if we look at the, those projects, uh, we have to consider their life cycle. So the, the life cycle would be, um, I mean, we have to assess. Uh, uh, how to sustain it after the project ends or whether we need to sustain it at all because this is another question or when do we for instance can stop sustaining it because you know we're not talking about it uh, in this way but uh but it's also like that uh, perhaps not all projects need to be sustained forever because for instance look at the the one we we just showed the the atlas of holocaust literature i mean it's uh, 
for the sustainability reason is based on so on WordPress uh, a format, so it's easy to uh, to kind of um, uh, keep it uh, updated for longer, etc. But you know, internet changes, and and once in a while you need to you know kind of refresh the code, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This of course costs, uh, and there would there could be a moment in in the future when you kind of have to consider whether to close it or not. So this is like one thing. And, and we, we have to, of course, have this serious conversation also with scholars, like how we uh, how we see uh, this future and whether the future is open-ended or kind of close-ended. However, this is another, ex another issue here is that uh, even if we plan to close it, then um, we uh, we still need to have a kind of sustainable solution for to preserve the data and the content. So, so for instance, the stuff we did in the project should be uh, kind of preserved in this whatever you know uh, um more standard format in a repository or, or some kind of form long-term preservation preservation because i can imagine for instance that you know in 10 years the technology would be completely different but then somebody can take this data and make a different visualization out of it but the key here is to uh is to keep it in mind that you know the website like the I don't know, Shape ID, Shape ID Toolkit, for instance. Oh, it is actually a good example because uh, this is a website with uh, the resources. However, all the resources generated by the project are also stored in Zenodo. So they're kind of uh, this, uh, you have this kind of double strategy. So if the website like in the future is down, at least we we can preserve uh, the resources somewhere somewhere um, else, and of course there could be the next level of thinking about it. So also to preserve somehow the connection between resources, if there are like links between the text, so perhaps somehow we can also present in a different way. Uh, I may add something about it later, but I see that there are like different uh, comments here in line, so I, I don't want to monopolize the discussion. Yes, Carla, and then Marta, please. Uh, hello. Uh, I, I have a, a question of, of my own here on my side, but I will also uh, use this time to introduce um, a project that is going on in Open Edition, and I have a colleague here that is going to uh, complement it, complete it later. So uh, my question regards uh, training and education, because um, as I see it, it's uh, I think it's part of the job and it's also important for advocacy. Uh, we have to present innovation, show how to use them, etc. Uh, and as you mentioned, like the need for more competence on the side of researchers, etc. So uh, I can see clearly the, the importance of training and education in this context. But when we think about innovative forms of training, uh, do you think that we can consider here like the, the same aspects, like how is it going to be received by the researchers and people who need the training, you know, to, to use different formats when we consider uh, the evaluation, uh, not only the quality of the training, but the, the results on the part of people who took it. And if you, uh, before answering my question, if you want to see uh, if uh, Laurent uh, could show us the example of he, what he was doing, he's doing in open edition. I think it would be uh, good to clarify a little bit. Uh, and sorry for putting you on the spot, Laurent. Where are you? <laughs> no problem. No, um... I take advantage of this meeting to maybe show what we are working on with uh, Open Edition. So I'm an uh, instructional designer and uh, I was recruited about one and a half year ago uh, during the COVID crisis to work on, uh, I wouldn't say innovative, uh, um, I mean, ways of presenting information, but more like uh, on the whole, uh, on building a, a full fledged uh, online learning program. And we need this, this framework. Uh, I've recently worked on how to um, educate a part of our users on uh, um, web analytics tools, which is Matomo. And we discussed the right way to uh, introduce it to our users, um, which form it should take. And uh, in the educational uh, community, uh, we, there is, a, um, well, there is a tool that we 
we use now, which is an HTML5 player, which allows us to uh, present information uh, through, for example, interactive videos and enrich this, uh, this format with, uh, for example, hyperlinks and other ways to, you know, introduce new content. So uh, instead of talking about it, I'm going to share with you what it looks like. Um, hopefully I will find, uh, I've got a lot of screen showing right now on my desktop and I'm not sure I am uh, sharing the right screen. No, it's not this one. Sorry about that. I haven't used Zoom uh, sharing, screen sharing for quite a while. <laughs> so I'm going to use this feature. It'll be much, much easier for me. Yeah, you just... So, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to see uh, show the portion of the screen. I'm sorry. I, I really am struggling to find, but now you can see the what I'm talking about. Can you see the découvrir Matomo? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to move this up a little bit. So this is a HTML5 player, and it's developed by uh, H5P, which is uh, originally an open source community, uh, and um, uh, we. Uh, actually chose this to combine two things, which is uh, a, a video, a video, basically a basic clip, video clip, uh, uh, giving an overview of Matomo Web Analytics tools and uh, HTML5, which is where we integrate, uh, we integrated the video, so uh, so that we create more interactive interactivity with with the video. So basically, we introduce like some chapters here. This is the, the overview, the outline of the video, and there is a, a chapter and you can move and skip some parts. Um, we have added subtitles, um, which requires to import a file uh, in a web uh, TTV format. And so, to, so the viewer can go through the video, it's uh, with the running commentary. And uh, it just explains in the beginning what is Matomo and what, what's the purpor, purpose of its use. So I'm going to move through. What's interesting is that, for example, we are introducing how to access the tool. And at some point we can add uh, a clickable hyperlink to go directly to the tool. Parts and here it's a very basic uh, setup screen capture. So I'm not going to show the whole video because there is also a running uh, commentary uh, with the video, but it's just to show you that it's a uh, quite a convenient tool for this kind of uh, training purpose because we are dealing here with uh, online tool and basically um, it's it's nice to have that kind of format and support just to for demonstration purposes and to help uh, viewers uh, um, learn about this particular tool and develop their skills on how to use it to their best uh, usage. And uh, what's also interesting with it is that uh, um, it's uh, it integrates uh, like labels to show under which license, Creative Commons license we, we put the, the module. So it's very convenient for, for sharing or uh, embedding in different projects or adjusting or adapting the content. Uh, for example, download, downloading here the archive, archive, it's an H5P archive, and you can adapt it, adjust it, change it to fit your, your own needs. And, uh, and as a content producer, decide how, how people, of course, are going to be able to modify uh, the, the project. So this also is a more global uh, reflection uh, because we are um, using this player in the context of uh, uh, deploying uh, Moodle learning management system 
so it, it's it's very much in line with that also so it's not it can be used as a standalone uh, application and uh, video presentation uh, and it also can integrate um, uh, learning managers manage assessment a system as we can add quiz for example in this video and other evaluation tools uh, so as we can we can check you know uh, on uh, 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 trainees uh, knowledge and uh, about about uh, the the tool so well that's a, a very basic tour around this uh, but it just maybe tells uh, it gives an example of what we are currently working on with uh, within Open Edition. Uh, okay, and I have a question. Will this sure. be available uh, on the same conditions as I know, the hypothesis, uh, for instance, so that everyone can use it uh, after, I don't know, some kind of a registration? No, it's, it's, it's well, what, I, what we wanted to do is basically is, uh, just work with the documentation, uh, basically the text, and give another point of entry into, um, you know, uh, uh, how to use the tool. Of course, there will be uh, text documentation going with this kind of content. And we can, as a standalone application, we can choose to embed it within the context of the documentation page. We can also, uh, through a special protocol, uh, we can, for example, have a separate use, adding a quiz, for example, just to make sure that, that uh, the viewers just uh, retain some information about the module and quiz them uh, within the, the module and uh, as a separate content integrated within Moodle. So that's why we, we uh, the idea is that we can have the flexibility to use it as a standalone tool just within uh, documentation and it's not part of a learning curriculum, but we so, can also be adapted to a learning environment where we can add, for example, uh, a quiz. And in that case, because it's a, uh, it's an, a native app uh, and it's already integrated within Moodle. So we can quiz people within this kind of content and it communicates with the grade, uh, Moodle gradebook, which helps define whether or not uh, learners have reached their learning objectives. Um, so uh, did I answer your question? Um, I <laughs> At some at some point, yes, but I still have some more. Sure, sure. <laughs> but I not, don't want to, you know, uh, just uh, dominate the discussion. So maybe I will just reach out to you and Carla with some okay. more questions. Of course, I will just Sorry, share after. in the chat the. Uh, I will just. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm very confused with um, how to use the control. Maybe can someone can just interrupt my screen sharing. Uh, but you should have a green uh, box somewhere. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, I think the small windows just were, were was hiding the the screen sharing feature control. Okay. So, do you have any other uh, questions or remarks uh, that you would like to share? Since we are slowly reaching uh, the noon, so the end of our meeting today. If I can just uh, uh, quick, I mean, with with uh, I would just re relate to the question of Carla's actually post uh, in relationship to this uh, resource. So, uh, um, of course, we can see that lots of this kind of teaching, uh, virtual teaching or MOOCs or whatever, uh, has taken place uh, really uh, early. Uh, and uh, actually, I think academia is more uh, ready to accept, you know, virtual learning <laughs> genres rather than um than virtual or extended uh, um let's say scholarly outputs in a way so for for the teaching reasons you know we we have lots of resources uh, uh, already however i i see a really nice uh, interesting potential in in the tool you you showed actually to kind of remediate this kind of genre of you know um of a textbook or something like this also kind of kind of product you know a product maybe not a good word but you know the this uh, this sort of uh, um, a book, uh, another form of a monograph, which is like more oriented on, on, on teaching. So, so again, for preparing such a resource, also uh, researchers, scholars, or whoever is involved should should be somehow credited and 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 and, and rewarded in the system of uh, evaluation. Again, and I, I, and I think that we're in this uh, in those case studies we're doing right now, we're not uh, directly addressing this point, but we definitely need to uh, keep it in mind. So uh, thanks for, for, for sharing that. 
Okay, so um, thank you. I think uh, we should end since it's almost 12. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed and we will see each other in uh, January in the next episode of our open chat. So thank you very much, everyone. And have a nice day and thank nice you. weekend. Thank well. you for your invitation. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.